As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will a poor thousand crowns. As I'll say, I charged my brother on his blessing to breed me well. There begins my sadness. My brother, Jacques, he keeps at school. Report speaks scoldingly of his profit. For my part, he keeps me rustically at home, or speak more properly, stays me here at home unkept. For call you this keeping, for a gentleman of my birth, that differs not from the stalling of an ox. His horses are bred better. For besides that they are fair with their feeding, they're taught their manage, and to that end, riders dearly hired. But I, his brother, gain nothing under him but growth, for the which his animals on their dunghills are as much bound to him as I. Besides this nothing that he so plentifully gives, the something that nature gives, his countenance seems to take from me. This is it, Adam, that grieves me. The spirit of my father goes strong in me. I, I can no longer endure it. And yet I know no wise remedy how to avoid it. Yonder comes my master, your brother. Go apart, Adam. Thou should hear how he will shake me up. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing, sir. I am not taught to make anything. What mar you then, sir? Mary, sir, I'm helping you to mar that which God made, a poor, unworthy brother of yours with idleness. Mary, sir, be better employed and be not a wire. Shall I feed your hogs and eat husks with them? What particle portion have I spent that I should come to such a penury? Know you where you are, sir. Oh, sir, very well. Here in your orchard. Know you before whom, sir? I, sir. Better than him I am before knows me. I know you are my elder brother. In the same gentle condition of my blood, you should so know me. I have as much of my father in me as you, albeit your coming before is nearer to his reverence. What? Boy. Come, come, elder brother, thou art too young in this. Will thou lay hands on me, villain? I'm no villain. I'm the youngest son of Sir Roland of Boys, and he's twice the one that says that my father begot villains. If thou were not my brother, I would not take this hand from my throat till this other hand and pull out thy tongue for saying so. Thou hast railed on myself. Sweet masters, be patient, for your father's remembrance. Be on the cord. Let me go, I say! Will not till I please. Thou shalt hear me. My father charged you on his will to give me good education. Thou hast trained me like a peasant, obscuring and hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. I will no longer endure it. Therefore, allow me such exercises that may become a gentleman. Or give me the poor lottery my father left me by testament. With it, I will go buy my fortune. What will thou do, beg when that is spent? Well, sir, get you in. I shall not long be troubled with you. You shall have some part of your will. I pray you, leave me. I no further offend you than becomes me for my good. Get you with him, you old dog. His old dog, my reward. Most true, I have lost my teeth in your service. God be with my old master. He would not have spoke such a word. Is it even so? Begin you to grow upon me. I will physic your rankness and give no thousand crowns neither! Holodeny. Called your worship. Was not Charles the Duke's wrestler here to speak with me? So it please you. He importunes, he importunes access to you. He's at the door. Call him in. This will be a good way. Tomorrow the wrestling begins. Good morrow to your worship. Good Monsieur Charles. What is the new news in the new court? Oh, there is no news at the court, sir, but the old news. That is, the old duke has been banished by his younger brother, the new duke, and three or four of his loyal lords go with him to voluntary exile. Their lands and revenues enrich the new duke, so he gives them good leave to wander. Uh, can you tell if Rosalind, the duke's daughter, be banished with her father? Oh, no. But the duke's daughter, her cousin, loves her so, being ever from their cradles bred together. She's at the court now, and no less beloved of her uncle than his own daughter. Where will the old duke live? They say he is already in the forest of Arden, with many a merry men with him. They live like the old Robin Hood of England. They say many young gentlemen flock to him daily, and they fleet the time carelessly, as they did in the golden world. <laughs> what, you wrestle tomorrow before the new duke? Oh, Mary, do I, sir? <laughs> <laughs> and I came to acquit you with uh, a matter. It has been given to me, sir, secretly to understand that your younger brother Orlando hath a disposition to come disguised against me to try a fall. 
Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit, and he that shall escape me without some broken limb should acquit him well. <laughs> your brother is young and tender, and for your love I would loathe to foil him, as I must for mine honor if he do come in. Therefore, out of my love to you, I came here to acquaint you with all so that you may stay him from his intendment, or rather, brook such disgrace well, as he shall run into, in that he is a search of his own searching, Charles, altogether against my will. Charles, I, I thank thee for thy love to me, and thou shalt find I will most kindly requite. Yeah. I have noticed my brother's purpose here, and have by underhand means labored to dissuade him from it, but he is resolute. Tell me, Charles, it is the stubbornest young fellow of France, full of ambition and villainous and secret controver against me, his natural brother! Therefore, use thy discretion. I had as lief thou didst break his neck as his finger, and thou wert best look to it. For if thou dost him any slight disgrace, or if he do not mightily grace himself unto thee, he will practice against thee by poison, and trap thee in treacherous device, and he will not leave thee until he's taken thy life by some indirect means or other. For I say to you, and almost with tears I speak, there is no one so young and so villainous this day living. I, I speak but brotherly of him, but if I were anatomized thee as he is, I would blush and weep, and thou must look pale and wonder. I am heartily glad I came hither to you. <laughs> if he do come in tomorrow, I'll give him his payment. If he ever go alone again, I'll never wrestle for prize more. <laughs> God rest you, worship. <laughs> Farewell, good Charles. Now I will stir this gangster. I hope to see an end of him. For my soul, yet I not know why, hates nothing more than he. He's gentle, never schooled and yet learned, full of noble device of all things, enchantedly beloved, and in the very heart of the world and that of my own people that best know him, that I am left altogether misprized. But it shall not be so long. This wrestler will clear all. There is nothing but to kindle the boy hither, which now I will go about. Sweet, my cause be merry. Dear Celia, I show more mirth than I am mistress of, and would you yet I were merrier? Unless you can teach me to forget a banished father, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. Here when I see thou lovest me not with the full weight that I love thee. If my uncle, thy banished father, had banished thy uncle, the duke, my father, so thou hast still been with me, I could have taught my love to take thy father from mine. So wouldst thou, if the truth of thy love to me were so righteously tempered as mine is to thee. Well, I will forget the condition of my estate to rejoice in yours. You know my father hath no child but I, nor none is like to have, and truly, when he dies, you shall be his heir, for what he had taken away from your father for force, I will render thee again in perfection. By mine honor, I will, and when I break that oath, let me turn monster. <laughs> Therefore, my sweet rose, my dear rose, be merry. From henceforth I will, cuz, and devise sport. Let me see, um, what think you of falling in love? Mary, I prithee do to make sport with all, but love no man in good earnest, nor... No further in sport, neither than with safety of a pure blush thou mayst in honor come off again. What shall be our sports then? Let us mock the good housewife fortune from her wheel, so that her gifts may henceforth be bestowed equally. I would that we could do so, for her benefits are mightily misplaced, and the bountiful blind woman doth most mistake in her gifts to women. Tis true, for though she makes fair, she scarce makes honest. <laughs> And though she makes honest, she makes very ill favoredly. Nay, now thou goes from fortune's office to nature's. Fortune doth reign in gifts of the world, not in the lineaments of nature. No. When nature hath made a fair creature, may she not, by fortune, fall into the fire? Though nature hath given us wit to flout at fortune, hath not fortune sent in this fool to cut off the argument? Indeed, there's fortune too hard for nature, when fortune hath sent nature's natural to be the cutter off of nature's wit. 
peradventure this is not fortune's work, neither but nature's who perceiveth our natural wits too dull to reason of such goddesses, <laughs> and hath sent this natural to be our whetstone, for always the dullness of the fools is the whetstone of the wits. How now, wit? Whither wander you? Mistress, <clears throat> you must come away to your father. Were you made the messenger? No, by mine honor. But I was bid to come for you. When I learned you that, O oh, fool. Of a certain knight that swore by his honor they were good pancakes, and swore by his honor the mustard was not. Now I'll stand to it that the pancakes were not, but the mustard was good. But was not the knight forsworn? How prove you this in the great heap of your knowledge? <laughs> Aye, Mary, now unmuzzle your wisdom. Stand you both forth now, stroke your chins, and swear by your beards that I am a knave. By our beards, if we had them, thou art. By my knavery, if I had it, then I were. But if you swear by that, that is not, you are not forsworn. Nor was the knight swearing by his honor, for he never had any. Or if he had, he swore it all away before he ever saw those pancakes or that mustard. <laughs> Prithee, who is it thou means? Oh, uh, one that old Frederick, your father, loves. Oh, my father's love is enough to honor him. Enough, speak no more of him. You'll be whipped for taxation one of these days. It is a pity that fools cannot speak wisely on what wise men do foolishly. <laughs> By my troth, thou speakest true. For ever since the little wit that fools have was silence, the little foolery that wise men have makes great show. Ah. Oh, here comes much from the view. Oh, with his mouth full of news. Oh, which he shall put on us as pigeons feed their young. Then shall we be news crammed. Oh, the better will be the more marketable. <laughs> Bonjour, Monsieur Le Bieux. What's the news? Fair princess, you have lost much good sport. Sport? Of what color? What color? Madam, um, how shall I answer you? As wit and fortune will. Or as the destinies decree. Well said. That was laid on with a trowel. Uh, nay, if not by my rank. Oh, thou losest thy old smell. <laughs> <laughs> you amaze me, ladies. I would have told you of good wrestling, which you have lost the sight of. Yet tell us the manner of the wrestling. Ah, I will tell you the beginning. And if it please your ladyships, you may see the end, for the best is yet to do. And here, where we are, they are coming to perform it. <gasps> well, the beginning that is dead and buried. <clears throat> there comes an old man and his three sons. I can match this beginning with an old tale. Three proper young men of excellent growth and presence. With bills on their necks. Be it known unto all men by these presents. The <laughs> eldest of the three wrestled with Charles, the Duke's wrestler, which in a moment Charles threw him and broke three of his ribs <gasps> that there is little hope of life left in him. <sighs> so he served the second, and so the third, yonder they lie. The poor old man, their father, making such pitiful dole over them <laughs> that all the beholders take his part with weeping. Alas! And what is the sport, monsieur, that the ladies have lost? Why this that I speak of? Ah, thus men grow wiser every day. This is the first I heard that the breaking of ribs was sport for ladies. Or I, I promise thee. But is there any else that longs to hear this music in his side? Is there yet another that dotes upon rib breaking? Come, cousin, shall we see this wrestling? Ah, uh, you must if you stay here, for here is the place appointed for the wrestling, and they are coming to perform it. Don't be sure they are coming. Let us stay now to see it. <laughs> Come on, since the youth will not be entreated his own peril on his forwardness. Is yonder the man? Even he, madam. Alas, he is too young, and yet he looks successfully. How now, daughter and cousin? Are you crept hither to see the wrestling? Aye, my liege, so please you give us leave. You will take a little delight in it, I can tell you. There is such odds in the man. In pity of the challenger's youth, I would fain dissuade him, but he will not be entreated. Speak to him, ladies. See if you can move him. Uh, call him hither, Monsieur Le Bieux. Uh, do so. I will not be by. Monsieur the Challenger, the princess calls for you. I attend with all respect and duty. Young man, have you challenged Charles the wrestler? No, fair princess. Uh, he's the general challenger. I come but in as others do to try with him the strength of my youth. 
young gentlemen, your spirits are too low for your years. You have seen cruel proof of this gentleman's strength. If you could see yourself with your eyes or know yourself with your own judgment, the fear of this adventure would counsel you to a more equal enterprise. Therefore, we pray you, for your own safety, to embrace it and give over this intent. Do, good sir. Your reputation shall not, therefore, be misprized. We will make it our suit unto the duke that the wrestling might not go forward. I beseech you, uh, punish me not with your hard thoughts. Rather, let your hard, fair wishes and gentle thoughts go with me to my trial, wherein if I be foiled, there's but one shame who is never gracious. If killed, but one dead who is willing to be so. Do my friends no wrong, for I have no one to lament me. The world no injury, for in it I have nothing. Only in the world I take up a place which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. For the little strength that I have, I would it were with you and mine to eke out hers. <laughs> Fare you well. By heaven I be deceived in you. Your heart's desires be with you. Come! Where is this young gallant that is so desirous to lie with his mother earth? <laughs> Ready, sir, but as will have it in a more modest working. You shall try but one fall. No, I want your grace. Do not entreat him to a second that have so mightily persuaded him from a first. You mean to mock me after. You should not have mocked me before. But come, your ways. Go to! Oh! 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 Ah, now how can I speed my speed, young man? Oh! Oh! I will, I were invisible so I could catch the strong fellow by the leg. Grace, I am not yet well breathed. How dost thou, Charles? He cannot speak, my lord. Bear him away. Orlando, my leash, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. I would thou it's been son to some man else. The world esteemed thy father honorable, but I did find him still mine enemy. Thou shouldst have better please me with this deed, had it's thou descended from another house, but fare thee well. Thou art a gallant youth. I would thou had told me of another father. For I my father, cuz, would I do this? I am more proud to be Sir Roland's son. His youngest son I would not change that calling to be adopted heir to Frederick. My father loved Sir Roland as his soul, and all the world was of my father's mind. Had I before known this young man his son, I should have given him tears unto entreaties, and he should have thus ventured. Gentle cousin, let us go thank him and encourage him. My father's rough and envious disposition sticks me apart. Good sir, you are well deserved. If you keep your promises in law but justly, as you have exceeded all promise, your mistress shall be happy. Gentlemen, wear this for me. One out of suits with fortune that could give more, but that her hand lacks means. Shall we go, cousin? Aye. Fare you well, fair gentleman. Can I not say I thank you? My better parts are all thrown down, and that which here stands up is but a quintain, a mere lifeless block. Well, he calls us back. My pride fell with my fortunes. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call, sir? Sir, you have wrestled well and overthrown more than your enemies. <laughs> Will you go, cause have with you. Fare you well.
Oh, what passion hangs its weight upon my tongue! I cannot speak, but she urged conference. Oh, poor old Anto, thou art overthrown, or Charles, or something weaker masters thee. But, sir, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place. Albeit you have deserved high commendation, true applause, and love, yet such is now the Duke's condition that he misconstrues all that you have done. The Duke is humorous, and what he is indeed more suits you to conceive than I to speak of. Thank you, sir, and uh, pray tell me, which of the two was daughter to the Duke that was here at the wrestling? Oh, neither his daughter, if we judge by manners. But yet indeed, the shorter is his daughter, the other is daughter to the banished Duke, and here, um, detained by her usurping uncle to keep his daughter company. <laughs> his loves are dearer than the natural bond of sisters, but I can tell you that of late this Duke hath tamed displeasure against his gentleman grounded upon no other argument than that the people praise her for her virtues and pity her for her good father's sake. And, on my life, his mouths towards the lady will suddenly break forth. <laughs> Sir, fare you well. Hereafter, in a better world than this, I would desire more love and knowledge of you. I breast much bounded to you. Fare you well. Thus must I from smoke into smother, from tyrant duke to tyrant brother. But heavenly Rosalind. <laughs> why, cousin, why, Rosalind Cupid, have mercy, not a word. Not one to throw at a dog. No, thy words are too precious to be cast away upon a curse. Come. Throw some of them at me. Lay me with reasons. Then there were two cousins laid up, when the one should be lame with reason, and the other mad without any. What is all this for your father? No, some of it is for my child's father. Oh, how full of briars is this working day world! They are but burrs, cousin, thrown upon me in holiday foolery. If we walk not on the trodden path, our very petticoats may catch them. I could shake them from my coat. These birds are in my heart. Have them away! I would try if I could but cry him and have him. Come, come, wrestle with thy affection. Oh, they take the part of a better wrestler than myself. Oh, good wish upon you. You will try in time despite a fall. But turning these jests out of service, let us talk in good earnest. Is it possible on such a sudden for you to fall into so strong a liking of old Sir Roland's youngest son? The Duke, my father, loved his father dearly. Doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? By that sort of chase, I should hate him, for my father hated his father dearly. Yet I hate not Orlando. No, Faith, hate him not for my sake. Why should I not? Doth he not deserve well? Let me love him for that. And do you love him because I do? <laughs> Look, here comes the Duke, with his eyes full of anger. Mistress, dispatch him with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, Uncle? You, cousin, within these ten days that thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech your grace, let me the knowledge of my fault bear with me. If with myself I hold intelligence, or have acquaintance with mine own desire, if that I do not frantic, or do not dream, as I do trust that I am not, then, dear uncle, never so much as in a thought unborn did I offend your highness. Thus do all traitors. If their purgation did consist in words, they are as innocent as grace itself. Let it suffice thee that I trust thee not. Yet your mistrust cannot make me a traitor. Tell me whereon the likelihoods depends. Thou art thy father's daughter, there's enough. So was I when your highness took his dukedom. So was I when your highness banished him. Treason is not inherited, my lord. Or if we did derive it from our friends, what's that to me? My father was no traitor. Then, good my liege, mistake me not so much to think my poverty is treacherous. Dear Sovereign, hear me speak. Aye, Celia, we stayed her for your sake. Else she had with her father ranged along. I did not then entreat to have her stay. It was your pleasure and your own remorse. I was too young at that time to value her, but now I know her. For if she be a traitor, then so am I. For even still we have slept together, rose together at an instant, learned, played, eat together. And wheresoever we went, like Juno Swan, still we went coupled together. She is too subtile for thee, and her smoothness 
Her very silence and her patience speaks to the people and they pity her. Thou art a fool. She robs thee of thy name and that will show more bright and seem more virtuous when she is gone. Then open not thy lips. Firm and irrevocable is my doom which I have passed upon her. She is banished. Pronounce that sentence then on me, my liege, for I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. You, niece, provide yourself. If you outstay the time upon mine honor and in the greatness of my word, you die. Oh, poor Rosalind, whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change fathers? I will give thee mine. I charge thee, be not thou more grieved than I am. I have more cause. <laughs> thou hast not. I prithee be cheerful. Didst thou not hear that the Duke hath banished me, his daughter? That he hath not. No, hath not. Rosalind then lacks the love that teacheth thee that thou and I am one. Shall we be sundered? Shall we be parted, sweet girl? No. Let my father seek another heir. Therefore, devise with me uh, how we may fly whither to go and what we may bear with us. And do not seek to take this change upon yourself, bearing your griefs alone and leaving me out. Now by this heaven our sorrows pale. Say what thou canst, I'll go along with thee. Why, whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the force of Arden. Alas, what danger that will be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far. Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in a poor and mean attire, with a kind of umber smirch my face, the like do you. So will pass along and never stir assailants. Were it not better, because that I am more than common tall, that I should uh, suit me all points like a man, a gallant kirtle axe upon my thigh, a boar's spear in my hand, and lie there in my heart, what hidden woman's fear there will. We'll have a swashing and a marshal outside, as many other mannish cowards have that do outface it with their semblances. What shall I call thee when thou art a man? I'll have no worse a name than Job's own page, and therefore look you call me Ganymede. But what will you be called? Something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Aliena. But, cousin, what if we essay to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? Would he not be a comfort <laughs> to our travels? He'll go along with the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. Let's away, gather our jewels and our wealth together, devise the fittest time and safest way to avoid pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. <laughs> Ah, and now my co-mates and cousins in exile, have that old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we not the penalty of Adam, the season's difference as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which even though it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, this is no flattery. These are counselors which feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in its head. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. Happy is your grace that can translate the stubbornness of fortune into so sweet and quiet a style. Come, shall we go kill us venison? And yet, it irks me, the poor dappled fools, being native burghers of this desert city, should, in their own confines, with forked heads, have their round haunches gored. Indeed, my lord. The melancholy Jacques screams at this. No. And in that same kind spirit, you need to assert more than your brother that has banished you. Today, my lord of Amiens and myself did steal behind him as he lay under an oak, whose antique fruit peeps out upon the brook that brawls along this wood, to the which place a sequestered stag, 
that hath from the hunter's aim taken a hurt. And indeed, my lord, the wretched creature did release such groans that stretched his leathern coat almost to bursting, and the big round tears coursed one another in piteous tears down his innocent nose. Oh. Thus the big hairy fool, much marked by the melancholy dark priest, stood on the extremest verge of the swift brook, augmented it with tears. And what said Jaquees? Did he not moralize this spectacle? <laughs> oh, yes. No. And to a thousand similes. Poor dear, quoth he, thou makest a testament as worldlings often do, to give up thy sum to that which hath too little. Thus he must invectively pierce it through country, city, court, and yea, our very own lives, claiming that we are mere usurpers, tyrants, and what's worse, to frighten and kill the animals in their own native dwelling place. <laughs> And did you leave him there in his contemplation? We did. We left him weeping and commenting upon the sobbing deer. Show me the place. I love to cope him in these sullen fits, for then he is full of matter. I'll bring you to him straight. Can it be possible that no man saw them? It cannot be. There are some villains of my court that are of consent and sufferance in this. I, I, I cannot hear of any that did see her. Um, uh, the ladies uh, attendants of her chamber uh, saw her a bed in, in the morning early, um, saw the bed and um, treasured of the uh, mistress. My lord, the princess gentlewoman, who confesses she secretly o'erheard your daughter and her cousin, commend the parts and graces of the wrestler that did but lately foil the sinewy Charles. And she believes wherever they are gone, you is surely in their company. Send to his brother, fetch that gallant hither. If he be absent, bring his brother to me. I will make him find him. Do this suddenly, and let not search an inquisition quail to bring again these foolish runaways. Go! Who's there? What? My young master. Oh, my gentle master. Oh, my sweet master. Oh, you memory of old Sir Roland. Why? What make you here? Why are you virtuous? Why do people love you? And wherefore are you gentle, strong, and valiant? Why would you be so fond to overcome the body pride of the humorous duke? Know you not, master, to some men, their graces serve them but as enemies? No more do yours. Your virtues, gentle master, are sanctified and holy traitors to you. Oh, what a world is this! Oh, what has come my offense him that bears it? Why? What's the matter? Oh, unhappy youth, come not within these doors. Within this roof, the enemy of all your graces lives. Your brother. No, no brother. Yet the son. Yet not the son. I will not call him son. Of him I was about to call his father. Mm, hath heard your praises. And this night he means to burn the lodging where you used to lie, and you within it. If he fail of that, he will have other means to cut you off. I overheard him and his practices. This is no place. This house is but a butchery. Abhor it. Fear it. Do not enter it. What whither, Adam, wouldst thou have me go? No matter whither, so you come not here. Would thou be beg for my food, or with a base and boisterous sword, and force a thievish living on the common road? This I will do. I know not what to do. It, this I will not do. Rather will I subject myself to the malice of a diverted blood and bloody brethren. But do not so. I have five hundred crowns. The thrifty hire I saved under your father, which I did store to be my foster nurse when service should in my old limbs lie lame and unregarded age in Corda's throne. Take that, and he that doth the ravens feed, yet providently caters for the sparrow, be comfort to my age. Here's the gold. All this I give you. Let me be your servant. Though I look old, yet I am strong and lusty. For in my youth, I never did apply hot and rebellious liquors in my blood. <laughs> Nor did not, with my bashful forehead, woo the means of weakness and debility. Therefore, my age is as a lusty winter. 
Frosty, what kind? Let me go with you. I'll do the service of a younger man in all your business and necessities. Oh, good old man. How well in thee appears the constant service of the antique world. One service slept for duty, not for me. Thou art not for the fashion of these times, when none will set up for promotion, and having such do choke their service up, even with the having. It is not so with thee. But good old man, thou prince a rotten tree, that cannot so much as a blossom yield and move all thy pains and husbandry. But come, thy ways. We'll go together, and ere we have thy youthful way just spent, we'll settle upon some low content. Master, go on. And I'll follow thee to the last gas with truth and loyalty. From seventeen years till now, almost four score, here lived I. But now, live there no more. I had seventeen years, many of their fortune seek. But at four score, it is too late a week. Yet fortune cannot recompense me better than to die well and not my master's debtor. Jupiter, how weary are my spirits! Oh, I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. I could find it in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and to cry like a woman, but I must comfort the weaker vessel as Dublin hose ought to show itself courageous to Petticoat. Therefore, courage, good Eliana. Pray you bear with me. I cannot go further. <laughs> for my part, I had rather bear with you than bear you. Yet I think I should bear no cross if I did bear you, for I think you have no money in your purse. Well, this is the forest of Arden. I now am I in Arden, the more fool I. When I was at home, I was in a better place. But travelers must be content. Aye, <laughs> be so good, Touchstone. Uh. For look you who comes here, a young man and an old in solemn talk. That is the way to make her scorn you still. Oh, Corin. That thou knewest how I do love her. I partly guess, for I have loved her now. No, Corin, being old, thou canst not guess. But I'm sure in thy youth thou wast as true a lover as ever did sigh upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I think did never man love so, how many actions most ridiculous Hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? Oh, into a thousand that I have forgotten. Oh, then thou hast never loved so heartily. <laughs> if thou rememberest not the slightest folly that love did draw thee into, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not sat as I do now, wearing thy hearer in thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company abruptly, as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. Phoebe, Phoebe, Phoebe! <laughs> Alas, poor shepherd, in searching of thy wound, I have by hard adventure found mine own. In thy mind, I remember when I was in love. I broke my sword upon a stone and bid him take that for coming a night to Jane's smile. Oh, I remember the kissing of her battler, and the cows dugs her pretty chapped hands had milked. <sighs> oh, we that are true lovers run in the strange capers, but as all is mortal in nature, so is all nature and love mortal in folly. Thou speakst wiser than thou art aware of. <laughs> Nay, I shall never be aware of mine own wit till I break my shins against it. Jove, Jove, this shepherd's passion is much upon my fashion. And mine, and it grows something, oh, stale with me. Oh, I pray one of you go speak to yon man and ask if he for gold will give us food. I faint almost to death. Holla, you clown. Peace, fool, he's not thy kinsman. Who calls? You're better, sir. Else are they very wretched. Peace, peace, I say. Good evening to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir. And to you all. Ah, I prithee, gentle shepherd, if that love or gold can in this desert place, by entertainment, bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here's a young maid with travel much oppressed and faints for succor. Fair sir, I do pity her, and wish more for her sake than mine own. My fortunes were better able to relieve her, but I am a shepherd to another man. Do not shear the flocks I graze. My master's of a 
churlish disposition and little next to find the way to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. Besides, his couch, his flocks, and bounds of feed are now on sale, and at our sheep's cot now, by reason of his absence, there is nothing that you will feed on. But what is? Come see, and in my voice most welcome shall you be. What is he that shall buy his flocks and pasture? Now that young swain you saw but ere while that little cares for buying anything. I pray thee, if it stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage, the flock, and the pasture, and thou shalt have to pay for it of us. <laughs> and go mend thy wages. I like this place and can willingly waste my time in it. Assuredly, the thing is to be sold. Go with me. And if you like upon report the soil, the profit, and this kind of life, I will your very faithful feeder be, and buy it with your gold right suddenly. <laughs> Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me? Unto the sweet bird's throat, who'll tune a merry note? Come by me, come by me. Here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather. More, more, I prithee, more. It will make you melancholy, Monsieur Jacques. I thank it. More, I prithee, more. I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. More, I prithee, more. My voice is ragged. I know it cannot please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. Come, more, another stanzo. Call you a m stanzos? What you will, monsieur. Nay, I care not for their names. They owe me nothing. Will you sing? More at thy insistence than for my own pleasure. Well then, if ever I thank anyone, I will thank you. Come. Sing, and you that will not, hold your tongues. Then I'll end the song. Sirs, cover under this tree. The Duke will drink here a while. He hath been all this day to look for you. And I have been all this day to avoid him. He is too disputable for my company. I think of as many matters as he, but I give heaven thanks and make no boast of them. Come, Warble, come. Who doth fish and shun? And love to live in the sun, seeking food he eats, and pleased with his own feats. Come by me, come by me, here shall he see no enemy but a winter and rough weather. I will give you a verse to that note that I made in despite of my invention. And I shall sing it. Thus it goes. <laughs> if it do come to pass. Pass, pass, that any man turned ass, 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 leaving his wealth and ease, a stubborn will to please, Dr. May, Dr. May, here shall he see gross fools as he, if only... They'll come to me. What is that, Dr. Dame? Uh, tis a Greek invocation to call fools into a circle. Ha <laughs> ha! I will go to sleep if I can. If I cannot, I will rail against all the firstborn of Egypt. <laughs> and all to the Duke for his banquet is prepared. Master, I can go no further. Oh, how I die for food. Here lie I down and measure out my grave. Farewell, kind master. Why now, Adam? No greater heart in thee? Live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. If thought this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it or bring it to food for thee, eh? Thy conceit is nearer to death than thy powers. For my sake, 
Be comfortable. Hold death a while at arm's end. I'll be with thee presently. If I bring thee not something neat, I will give thee leave to die. But if thou diest before I return, thou art a mocker of my labor. Well said. I'll be with thee quickly, and thou looks cheerily. And yet thou liest in the bleak air. Come, I will bear thee to some shelter. Thou shalt not die for lack of dinner if there live anything in this desert. Cheerily, good Adam. I think he be transformed into a beast, for I can nowhere find him like a man. My lord, he has been even now gone hence. Here he was merry, hearing of a song. If he, compact of jars, grow musical, we shall have shortly discord in the spheres. <laughs> Go, seek him out. Tell him I would speak with him. He saves my labor by his own approach. Ah, no, monsieur! A oh, fool! Wait. A fool. I met! A fool in the forest, a, mo a motley fool, a miserable world. As I do live by food, I met a fool who, who laid him down and basked him in the sun and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, in good set terms. And yet, a motley fool, good morrow fool, quoth I. Now, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking at it with lackluster eye, says very wisely, It is ten o'clock, thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more twill be eleven. And so, from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, oh. and thereby hangs a tail. When I did hear the motley fool thus Moral on the time, my lungs began to crow like chanticleer that fools should be so deep contemplative. And I did laugh, sans intermission, an hour by his dial. <laughs> oh, noble fool, worthy fool. Motley is the only where. What fool is this? A worthy fool. One that hath been a courtier and says, if ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to know it. And in his brain, which is as dry as the remainder biscuit after a voyage, he is <laughs> strange places crammed with observation, the which he vents in mangled forms. Oh, that I were a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. Then thou shalt have one. It is my only suit, provided that you weed your better judgments of all opinion that grows rank in them that I am wise. I must have liberty with all, as large a charter as the wind to blow on whom I please, for so fools have. And they that are most galled by my folly, they most must laugh. And why, sir, must they so? Invest me in my motley. Give me leave to speak my mind, and I will through and through cleanse the foul body of the infected world if they will patiently receive my medicine. Fie on thee, I can tell what thou wouldst do. What? For a counter, would I do but good? Most mischievous foul sin and chiding sin, for thou thyself hast been a libertine, mm -hmm. as sensual as the brutish sting itself, which, with all your headed evils and bossed sores that thou with license of free will hast caught, wouldst thou then disgorge into the general world? Why, why, who cries out on pride that can therein tax any private party? Doth it not flow as hugely as the sea till that the weary very means do ebb? Or who is he? of basest function that says his bravery is not on my cause, thinking that I mean him, but therein suits his folly to the metal of my speech. There then, how then, what then? Let me see wherein my tongue hath wronged him. If it do him right, he hath wronged himself. If he be but free, why then my taxing, like a wild goose, flies unclaimed of any man. You see what I mean? 
But who comes here? Forbear and eat no more! I have eaten none yet. Nor shall not till necessity be served. Of what kind does this man come of? Are thou thus bold in man by thy distress, or else a rude despiser of good manners, that in civility thou seemst so empty? Thou touchest my vein at first, the pointy thorn of bare distress hath taken from me the show of smooth civility. Yet I am inland bred, and know some nurture, but to the forbear, I say! He dies as such as any of this fruit, till I and my affairs are answered. And he will not be answered with reason, I must die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food, and let me have it! <laughs> Sit down and feed. Welcome to our table. Speak so gently. Pardon me. I thought that all things were savage here. Therefore put on the countenance of stern command, and to whatever you are that in this desert inaccessible, under the shade of melancholy boughs, Lose and neglect the creeping hours of time. If ever thou hast seen better days, if ever the more bells have knolled the church, if ever have sat at any good man's feast, if ever from thy eyelid wiped a tear, and, and know it is to pity and to be pitied, then let gentleness thy strong enforcement be, in the which hope I blush and hide my sword. True it is that we have seen better days, um, and have with holy bell been knolled to church, and sat at good men's feasts, and wiped our eyes of drops that sacred pity hath engendered. Therefore sit you down in gentleness, and take upon command whatever we have that to your wanting may be ministered. And then but forbear your food a little while, while it's like a doe I go to fetch my fawn and bring it something to eat. There is a poor old man who after me hath many a weary step lift in pure love, though he be sufficed oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger, I will not touch a bit. Go! Seek him out, and we will nothing waste till you return. I thank you most, and you bless for your good comfort. Thou seest, we are not all alone unhappy. <laughs> this wide and universal theater plays more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. And then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, <laughs> creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. <laughs> and then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like a pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly and good, capon lined with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose, well saved, a world too wide for his trunk shank and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is that of second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste. Sans everything. What? We just found him! Go seek him out. Oh, welcome. Set you down your venerable burden and, and feed. I thank you most for him. So had your need. I can scarce speak to thank you for myself. Welcome. I will not trouble you as yet to question you about your fortunes. Uh, play music and good cousin, sing. Man's ingratitude. 
Thy teeth are not so keen because thou art not seen, although thy Life is mostly jolly. If thou art indeed the good Sir Rollins' son, as you have whispered faithfully that you were, and as mine eye doth his effigies witness, most truly limbed and living in your face, be truly welcome hither. I am the Duke that loved your father. And you, Old man, you are most welcome as thy master is. Support him by the arm. Give me your hand. Let me all your fortunes understand. Not seen him since, sir. Sir, that cannot be. But were I not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge, thou present. But look to it. Find out thy brother, wheresoever he is. Seek him with candle. Bring him dead or living within this twelfth month, or turn down no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine were seizure. Do we seize into our hands until thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I have never loved my brother in my entire life. <laughs> More villain now. Well, push him out of doors and let my men of such a nature make an extent upon his house and lands. Do this expediently and turn him going. There, my verse, in witness of my love, and thy thrice crowned queen of knights survey, with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above, the huntress's name my full life doth sway. O oh, Rosalind, these trees shall be my books, and their barks, these thoughts all character, that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run. Run, Orlando, carve on every tree, the chaste, the fair, the unexpressive she! And how like you this shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? Surely, uh, in respect that it is a shepherd's life, I like it very well. But in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. And in respect that it is solitary, uh, I like it very well. But in respect that it is private, it is a very vile life. Vile? But in respect that it is in the fields, it pleaseth me well. But in respect, it is not in the courts. Oh, it is tedious. So it is a spare life. Mind you, it, it fits my humor well. But as there's not much plenty in it, oh, it goes much against my stomach. Oh, has there any philosophy in me, Shepherd? No more, but that I know. The more one sickens, the worse it is he is. Hmm. And that he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. Huh. The property of rain is to wet, yeah. fire to burn, good pasture makes fat sheep, and a great cause of the night is the lack of the sun. And that he that hath learned no wit by nature nor art may complain of good breeding, or comes of a very dull kindred. Oh, such a one is a natural philosopher. Was ever in court, Shepherd? No, truly. Oh, then thou art damned. Nay, I hope. Uh, truly, thou art damned, like an ill-roasted egg, all on one side. For not being at court, your reason. <laughs> if thou wast never at court, 
then thou never sawest good manners. If thou never sawest good manners, then thy manners must be wicked. And wickedness is sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a perilous state, shepherd. Oh, not a whit, Touchstone. Those that are good manners at the court are as ridiculous in the country oh. as the behavior of the country is most mockable at the court. Huh. You told me you salute not, but... Kiss your hands? Yeah. Now that courtesy would be uncleanly of courtiers for shepherds. Ah, instance, briefly, come, instance. We are still handling our ewes, and their fells, you know, are greasy. Ah, and do not your courtiers' hands sweat? And is not the grease of a mutton as wholesome as the sweat of a man? Shallow, shallow. A better instance, I say, come. Besides, our hands are hard. And your lips shall feel them the sooner. <clears throat> Shallow again, a more sounding instance. Come. And they are often tarred over with the surgery of our sheep. Oh. <laughs> oh. And would you have us kiss tar? <laughs> the courtier's hands are perfumed with them. Um, <laughs> <Sit it? laughs> Most shallow man. Thou learns me in respect of a good piece of flesh. Learn from the wise and prepend. Civet is of a baser birth than tar, the most uncleanly flux of a cat. Oh. Oh. <laughs> in the instant, shepherd? No, um, no, uh, you have too courtly a wit for me. I'll, I'll rest. Rest? Rest? God make incision in thee, thou art raw. No. Sir, I am I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat, get that I wear, and owe no man hate, envy no man's happiness, and glad of other men's good, content with my harm. But the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. Oh that is another simple sin in you, shepherd. See? To bring your ewes and your rams together, and to offer to get your copulation off of the living cattle? Oh! If thou beest not damned for this, the devil himself will have no shepherds! <laughs> uh, I, here comes young Master Ganymede, oh. my mistress's brother. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her worth, being mounted on the wind, through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest lined are but black to Rosalind. Ugh. Let no face be kept in mind but the fair of Rosalind. Ugh. Rosalind. <laughs> I'll rhyme you so eight years together, sleeping hours and dinners and suppers accepted, it is the right butter woman's rank to market. <laughs> Out, fool. Oh, for a taste. <clears throat> if a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosaline. If the cat will after kind, so be sure will Rosa blind. Winter garments must be lined, so must slender Rosaline. <gasps> they that reap must sheep and bind, then to cart with Rosaline. Oh, sweetest nut hath sourest rind. <gasps> Such a nut is Rosaline. He that sweetest rose must find, must find love's prick. And Rosaline. Ah, this is a very false gallop of verses. Why do you infect yourself with them? Peace, you dull fool! I found them on a tree. Well, truly, the tree yields bed fruit. Oh, peace. Here comes my sister reading. Stand aside. Why should this a desert be? For it is unpeopled? No. Tongues I'll hang on every tree that shall civil sayings show. Some. How brief the life of man runs his erring pilgrimage that the stretching of a span buckles in his sum of age. Some of violated vows twixt the souls of friend and friend, but upon the fairest boughs or at every sentence end will I, Rosalind Wright, teaching all that read to know the quintessence of every spite heaven would in little show. Therefore, heaven made your charge. That one body should be filled with all graces wide and large. Nature presently distilled, Helen's cheek, but not her heart. Cleopatra's majesty, Atalanta's better part. 
Sad Lucretia's modesty, thus Rosalind of many parts by heavenly synod was devised of many faces, eyes, and heart. Oh. To have the touch's dearest prize, heaven would that she these gifts should have, and I to live and die her slave. Oh, most gentle Balthader, what tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners withal, and never once cried, have patience, good people. How now? Back, friends, shepherd, go up a little. Go you with him, sirrah. Let's make our honorable retreat, though not with uh, bag and baggage, uh, oh, but with scrip and scrippage. Didst thou hear these verses? Oh yes, I heard them all, and more, for some of them had in them more feet than the verses would bear. That's no matter, the feet may yet bear the verses. Aye, but the feet were lame, and could not bear themselves without the verse, and therefore stood lamely in the verse. But it's so here without wondering how thy name can be hanged and carved upon these trees. I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came. For look you here what I found on a palm tree. I was never so bereft since Pythagoras' time that I was an Irish rat, which I can hardly remember. Know you who had done this? Is it a man? I and the chain that you once wore about his neck. Change your color. I pray thee who? Oh, Lord! Oh, Lord! It is a hard matter for friends to meet, and yet mountains may be brewed by earthquakes and so encounter. Nay, but who is it? Is it possible? I pretty. Now with most petitionary vehemence, tell me who it is. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, and yet again wonderful, wonderful, most wonderful, and after that, out of all of me, got my complexion. Dost thou think, though I am capricious like a man, I have a doublet and hose at my disposition? One inch of delay more is a south sea of discovery. I pray thee, tell me who it is quickly, and speak apace. I would that thou couldst stammer that thou mightst pour the name of this concealed man out of thy mouth, as wine comes out of a narrow-mouthed bottle, either too much at once or none at all. I pray thee, take the cork out of thy mouth that I may drink thy tidings. So you may put a man in your belly. <laughs> is he of God's making? What manner of man? Is his head worth a hat, or his chin worth a beard? Nay, he hath but a little beard. Well, God will send more, if he be thankful. Let me stay the growth of his beard, if thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin. It is young Orlando, who tripped up the wrestler's heels, and your heart both in an instant. Nay, but the devil take mocking. Speak sad brow and true maid. If it cost, is he? Orlando? <laughs> Orlando. <laughs> well, last the day, what shall I do with my doublet and hose? What didst he when thou sawest him? Well, what said he? How looked he? Where and went he? What makes he here? Did he ask for me? How arted he with thee? And uh, when shalt thou see him again? Quickly, answer me in one word. <laughs> <laughs> you will have to borrow me gargantua's mouth first. Is a word too great for any mouth of this age's size? To answer I or nay to these particulars is more to say than in a catechism. But doth he know that I am here in this forest and in man's apparel? Looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled? It is easier to count atomies than it is to resolve the propositions of a lover. But take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance. I found him under a tree like a dropped acorn. It may well be called Job's tree when it drops forth fruit. <laughs> Give me audience, good madam. Proceed. There lay he stretched along like a wounded knight. Oh, Although it be pity to see such a sight, it well becomes the ground. <laughs> Cry holla to thy tongue, I for thee, it corvettes unseasonably. He was furnished like a hunter and- Ooh, ominous, he comes to kill my heart. <laughs> I would sing my song without burden. You bring me out of tune. Do you not know I am a woman when I think I must speak? Sweet, stay on. You bring me out. What soft comes not he here? Uh, Tis he, I sling by and note him. I thank you for your company, but I had as lief have been myself alone. As had I. And for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. Let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be better strangers. I pray you, more no more trees with writing love songs in their barks. 
I pray you mar no more my verses with reading them ill-favoredly. Rosalind is your love's name. Yes, Jess. I do not like her name. <laughs> there was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. What stature is she of? She's as high as my heart. You are full of pretty answers. I will try no breather in this world but myself, against whom I know most faults. The worst fault you have is to be in love. It's a fault I will not change for your best virtue. I am weary of you. By my troth, I was looking for a fool when I found you. Oh, he's drowned in the brook. Look what in and you choose him. There I shall see mine own figure. Which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. I'll tarry no longer with you. Farewell, good Signor Love. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, get on so melancholy. I will speak to him like a saucy lackey, and under that habit, play the knave with him. Do you hear, Forrester? Very well, what would you? I pray you, what is it, the clock? You should ask no time of day. There is no clock in the forest. Oh, then there is no true lover in the forest. Else sighing every minute and groaning every hour should detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. Well, why not the swift foot of time? Had that not been as proper? No, no, sir. Time travels in divers paces with divers persons. I'll tell you who time trots with all, who he ambles with all, who he gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. I prithee, who doth he trot with all? Mary, he, he trots hard with a young maid uh, between the contract of her marriage and the night it is solemnized. If the interim be but a said night, time's pace is so hard that it seems the length of seven years. Who ambles time with all? With a priest that lacks Latin and a rich man that hath not the gout. For the one sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. The one lacking the burden of a lean and wasteful learning, and the other knowing no burden of heavy, tedious penury. These time ambles with all. Who doth he gallop with all? With a thief to the gallows, for though he go as soft as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. Who stays it still with all? <laughs> with lawyers in the vacation. For they sleep between term and term, and therefore they perceive not how time moves. Where dwell you, pretty youth? With the shepherdess, my sister, uh, here in the skirts of the forest, as fringe upon a petticoat. Are you native of this place? As the bunny that you see dwell where she is kindled. Your accent is something finer than can be purchased in so removed a dwelling. Indeed, I have been told so of by many. But an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was in his youth an inlandman, one who knew courtship too well. For there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God that I am not a woman to be touched with so many giddy offenses as he hath generally taxed their whole sex with all. Can you remember any of these principal evils he laid to the charge of women? They were none principal. They were all like one another, as halfpence are. Every one fault seeming monstrous, till his fellow fault came to match it. I prithee, recount some of them. No, I will not cast away my physic, but on those that are sick. There is a young man, haunts our forest, and abuses our young plants, with carving Rosalind upon their barks, hangs odes on brambles and elegies on hawthorns, all forsooth defying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaped. Uh, pray you tell me your remedy. There are none of my uncle's marks in you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. Well, where's marks? A lean cheek, which you have not, a blue eye and sunken, which you have not, an unquestionable spirit, which you have not, a beard unkempt, which you have not, but I do pardon you for that, for your simply having in beard is a younger brother's revenue. Then your hose should be ungartered, your sleeve unbuttoned, your bonnet unbanded, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless state of desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrement, as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. <laughs> Fair youth, I, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it. You may as soon make her that you love believe it, which, I warrant you, she is apter to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points wherein women still give the lie to their conscience. But, in good sooth, are you he that hangs the verses on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to the youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. <laughs> Love is merely a madness. 
Yet I profess, curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one. And in this matter, he was to imagine me his mistress, his love, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something, and for no passion truly anything, as boys and women, for the most part, are often cattle of this color, would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, so much so that I drave my suitor from his mad humor of love to a living humor of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and live in a nook, merely monastic, and thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon myself to wash your liver clean as a sound sheep's heart that there be not one spot of love in it. I would not be cured so. I would cure you. If you would, but call me Rosalind and come every day to my couch and woo me. Now, uh, by the faith of my love, I will. Uh, tell me where it is. Go with me to it and I will show it to you. And by the way, you shall tell me where in this forest you live. Will you go? Uh, with all my heart, fair youth. Uh, nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? Quickly, quickly, Jesus. I will fetch up your goats, Audrey. And how, Audrey, am I the man yet that my simple feature can pinch you? <laughs> features? Lord warrant us, what features? Well, I am with thee and, and thy goats. As the most capricious poet, honest Ovid was amongst the goats. Oh, knowledge ill-inhabited, worse than Jove in a thatched house. <laughs> When a man's verses cannot be understood, or his good wit seconded with the foreign child, understanding it strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. Oh, why would the gods have made thee poetical? <gasps> I do not know what poetical is. <laughs> is it honest indeed in word? Is it a true thing? <laughs> no, truly. For the truest poetry is... The most feigning. <laughs> and lovers are given to poetry. <laughs> and what they swear by poetry, it is said as lovers they do feign. <laughs> do you wish then that the gods had made me political? I do, truly. <laughs> For what thou swear to me that thou art honest, but if thou wert a poet, I would have some hope thou didst feign. Would you not have me honest? Uh, no, truly. Well, unless thou wert hard favored, for to have honesty coupled to beauty is to have honey a sauce to sugar. A material fool. Well, I am not fair. Therefore, I pray the gods make me honest. <laughs> truly, and to cast away honesty upon a foul wench would have put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a wench. Though I do thank the gods, I am foul. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise be the gods for thy foulness. Wenchiness may come hereafter. But be it as it may be, I will marry thee. And to that extent, I have been with Sir Oliver Martex, the vicar of the next village, who hath promised to meet me in this place of the wood and to couple us. <laughs> I'll fancy this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. A man may be, if he were of a fearful heart, Stagger in this attempt to have no temple but woods, no assembly but horned beasts, but what though? Courage. <laughs> Here comes Sir Oliver, Sir Oliver Martex. Oh, you are very well met. Will you dispatch of us here under uh, this tree, or shall we go with you to your chapel? Is there none here to give the woman? I will not take her on gift of any man. Truly, the woman must be given when the marriage is not lawful. Uh, proceed! What? Proceed! I'll oh. give her. Oh. Uh, uh, good evening, good master, uh, what you call it? Uh, 
You are very well met. God yield your last company. I am very glad to see you. Even a, a toy in hand here should may pray be covered. <laughs> Will you be married, Motley? As an ox hath his bow, the horse is curbed, a falcon her bell, so a man hath his desires. And as a pigeon's bill, so wedlock would be nibbling. And will you, being a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Oh. Get you to a church and have a good priest who can tell you what marriage is there. Oh. <laughs> this fellow would but join you as they join Wainscot, and then, like, one of you will prove a shrunk panel and, like, green timber. Warp. Warp. Oh. I am not of the mind, but I would rather be married of him than of the other. Or he is not likely to marry me well, and not being well married would give me a good excuse hereafter to leave my wife. Go what? thou with me and let me counsel thee. Come, Audrey, we shall be married or we shall live in Baudry. <laughs> Farewell, Master Oliver. Not, oh sweet Oliver, oh brave Oliver, leave me not behind thee, but when thou wait be gone, I say I will not do wedding with thee. <laughs> Tis no matter, never a fantastical knave of them all should flout me of my calling. Never talk to me, I will weep. <laughs> do I prithee and yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man? But am I not caused to weep? Why did he say he would come this morning, but he comes not? Nay, certainly, there's no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes. I do not think he is a pig purse, nor a horse stealer. But for his verity in love, I think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm-eaten nut. Not true in love. True when he is in, but I think he is not in. But you have heard him swear downright he was. Was? <clears throat> is not is. Besides, the oaths of a lover are no stronger than the words of a tapster. They are both the confirmers of false reckonings. Besides, he attends here in the forest on the duke, your father. I met with the duke yesterday and had much question with him. He asked me of what parentage I was. I told him, of as good as he's. He laughed and let me go. But, but speak we of fathers when there is such a man as Orlando. Oh, that's a brave man. He speaks brave words, writes brave verses, swears brave oaths, and breaks them bravely. But come to hear. Good mistress, master, you have often inquired after the shepherd who complained of love, who you saw sitting by me on the turf, praising the proud, disdainful shepherdess that was his mistress. Well, what of him? If you would see a pageant truly played, between the pale complexion of true love and the red glow of scorn and proud disdain. Go hence a little, and I shall conduct you, if you will mark it. Oh, come, come, <laughs> let us remove. The sight of lovers feedeth both in love. Bring us to this sight, and you shall say, I'll prove a busy actor in their play. <laughs> Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me, do not, Phoebe. Say you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common executioner, whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humble neck, but begs pardon first. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Now tell us me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty, sure, and very probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things, who shut their coward gates on atomies, should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. Thou counterfeit to swoon, why now fall down? Or if thou canst not, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wound mine eye hath made in thee. Scratch thee with but a pin, and there remains some scar of it, Lean upon a rush, the cicatrice incapable in pressure thy palms the moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not. Nor am I sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Dear Phoebe, 
if ever, as that ever may be near, <laughs> you find in some flesh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the invisible wounds that love's keen arrows make. <laughs> but till that time come, not near me. And when that time come thou, afflict me with thy mocks. Pity me not, until that time I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you, who might be your mother that you insult, exalt, and all at once over the wretched? What? Though you have no beauty in you, as by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed, must you therefore be proud and pitiless? What means this? Why do you look so upon me? Odds my little life, I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brow, your orange hair, your green eyes, nor your cheek of cream that can entain my spirits to your worship. And you, foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a properer man than she a woman. Tis fools such as you that make the world full of ill-favored children. Tis not her glass, <laughs> but you that flatters her. And out of you, she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But, mistress, know yourself. Down on your knees, and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you, friendly in your ear, sell when you can. You are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy. Love him. Take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So, take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I'd rather you chide than this man woo. He's fallen in love with her foulness, and she'll fall in love with my anger. If it be so, as quickly as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll sauce her with bitter words. Why do you look so upon me? For no ill will I bear you. I pray you, do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. And besides, I like you not. If you will know my house, tis at the tuft of olives here hard by. Come, sister, will you go? Shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister. Shepherdess, look on him better, and be not proud. Though all the world could see, there were none so abused in sight as he. Come, to our flock. Dead shepherd, now I find thy saw of might. Whoever loved it, loved not at first sight. Sweet baby. <laughs> what sayest thou, Silvius? Sweet baby, pity me. Why, I am sorry for you, dear Silvius. <laughs> Wherever sorrow is, relief would be if you do sorrow at my grief and love. By giving love, your sorrow and my grief were both exterminated. Thou hast my love is not that neighborly. I would have you. <laughs> Why, thou were covetousness. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee, and yet it is not that I bear thee love. But since that thou canst talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I shall endure, and I'll employ thee too. But do not look for further recompense in thine own gladness that thou art employed. Oh, so holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace that I would think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken years after the men that the main harvest reaps. Oh, loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll live upon. <laughs> Knowest thou the youth that spoke to me ere while? Not very well, but I have met him oft, and he hath bought the cottage in the bounds that the old carlet was once master of. Think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy. Yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Yet words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. Tis a pretty youth. Not very pretty, but sure he's proud. And yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion. And faster than his tongue did make offense, his eye did heal it up. He's not very tall, but for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so, and yet tis well. There was a pretty redness in his lip, a little riper and l more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. Tis just the difference betwixt the constant red and mangled damask. There be some women, Silvius, had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. And yet, I have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he to do to chide at me? He said my eyes were green and my hair orange. And now I remember it scorned at me. I marvel why I answered not again. But that's all one. A minute's is no quidditz. I shall write to, to him a very taunting letter. 
and thou wilt wear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? Baby. <laughs> With all my heart. <laughs> I'll write it straight. The matter is in my head and in my heart. I shall be bitter with him in passing short. Go with me, Silvius. I pray thee, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fellow. I am so. I do love it better than laughing. For those that are in extremity of either are abominable fellows, and do betray themselves to every modern censure worse than drunkards. Why, tis good to be sad and say nothing. <laughs> Why then, tis good to be a post. I have neither the scholar's melancholy, which is emulation, nor the musician's, which is fantastical, nor the courtier's, which is proud, nor the soldier's, which is ambitious, nor the lawyer's, which is politic, nor the lady's, which is nice, nor the lover's, which is all of these. But it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many simples, extracted from many objects, and yet the sundry contemplation of my travels in which my often rumination wraps me in a most humorous sadness. Alas, a traveler, by my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you've sold your lands to see other men, and then to have seen so much, but to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. Yes. I have gained my experience. And your experience makes you sad. I had rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad. And to travel for it, too. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Oh, nay then. God be with you. <laughs> Farewell, Monsieur Traveler. How now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You a lover? Nay, and you served me such another trick. Never come in my sight more! Dear Buth, I, I come within an hour of my promise. Break an hour's promise in love? No, he that would break a minute into a thousand parts and break but a part of that thousand part of a minute in the affairs of love, it may well be said of him that Cupid hath cracked him o'er the shoulder, but I'll warrant him half-hearted. Pardon me, dear Rosalind. Nay, then you be so tardy, come no more in my sight! I had as lief be wooed of a snail. Of a snail? Aye, of a snail. For though he arrives slowly, he carries his house on his head. A better offer, I think, than you make a woman. <laughs> and besides, he brings his destiny with him. What's that? Why, horns, as such as you are fain to be beholden to your wives for. But he arrives armed in his fortune and prevents the slander of his wife. Virtue is no horn maker. My Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. It pleaseth him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of a better leer than you. But come, woo me, woo me, for now I am in a holiday humor and like well enough to consent. Now, what would you say to me, and I were your very, very Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, you were better to speak first, then when you were graveled for a lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. How if the kiss be denied? Well, then she puts you to entreaty, and there begins new matter. Well, who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Mary, that should you, if I were your mistress. Else I should think my honesty above my wit. What, of my suit? Not out of your apparel, and yet out of your suit. Am I not your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Well, then, in her person, I say, I will not have you! Then in my own person, I die! Faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time there was never any man that died in his own person. Uh, that is to say, of a love cause. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. I would not have my right Rosalind of this mind. For I protest, her frown might kill me. By my life, it will not kill a fly. But, ah, uh, come, now I will play your Rosalind in a more coming-on disposition, and ask me what you will, I will grant it. And then love me, Rosalind. Aye, faith, will I? Fridays and Saturdays and all. And wilt thou have me? Aye, and twenty such. Oh, what sayest thou? Well, are you not good? I hope so. Well, then, can one desire too much of a good thing? But, come, sister, you shall play the priest and marry us. And Orlando, give me your hands. And what do you say, sister? Pray thee, marry us. I cannot speak the words. Ah, well, you must begin. Will you, Orlando? Fine, go to. Will you, Orlando, have to wife 
this Rosalind. I will. Aye, but when? Why, now, as fast as she'll marry us. Well, then you must say, I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I might ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for husband. Now, there's a girl who goes before the priest, and certainly a woman's thoughts run before her actions. So do all thoughts, they're winged. Mm. Now, tell me, how long would you have her after you've possessed her? Why, forever, and a day. Say a day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, but December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. <laughs> will, my, will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. <laughs> she is wise. Else she could not have the wit to do this. <laughs> the wiser, the waywarder. Make the door upon a woman's wit, and it will out of the casement. Shut that, and it will out of the keyhole. Stop that, and it will fly out with the smoke at the chimney. But uh, now I shall play a Rosalind in a more melancholy manner, and you shall come for free. Alas, dear Rosalind, I cannot. For these two hours must I leave thee. Alas, I cannot lack thee even two hours. You must attend the Duke at dinner. Uh, by two o'clock I'll be with thee again. I go your ways. Go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as much, but I thought no less. It was your flattering tongue that won me. But tis one cast away, and so come death. Two o'clock is your hour? Aye, dear Rosalind. Well, by my troth, and in good earnest, and God mend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical great promise, the most hollow lover, and the most unworthy of her that you call Rosalind, that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. So, beware my censure, and keep your promise. No rest for religion if thou wert indeed my Rosalind, so. Well, time is the old uh, justice that examines all such offenders, and so let time try. Adieu. Adieu. <laughs> simply misuse our sex in your love break. We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head so the world may see what the bird hath done to her own nest. Oh, cuz, 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 my pretty little cuz! Would that thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love, but it cannot be sounded. My affection hath an unknown bottom, like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather bottom less, for as fast as you pour affection in, it runs out. No faith. By that same wicked bastard of Venus that was begot of thought, conceived of spleen, and born unto madness, that blind, rascally boy that abuses everyone else's eyes because his own are out, let him be judged how deep I am in love. I'll tell thee, Eliana, I cannot be out of the sight of Orlando. I'll, I'll go find a shadow and sigh till he come, and I'll sleep. <laughs> that killed the deer. Sir, it was I. Let's present him to the duke like a Roman conqueror. And it would do well to set the deer's horns upon his head for a branch of victory. Have you no song, Forester, for this purpose? Yes, Monsieur. Sing it! <laughs> Tis no matter it be in tune so long as it make noise enough. <laughs> <laughs> What shall he have that killed the deer? His leather skin and horns to bear. So sing him home, so sing him home. The rest shall bear his burden. Take thou no scorn, thou no scorn to, wear to wear the horn. It was a crest ere thou was born. So sing him home, so sing him home. The rest shall bear his burden. The horn, the horn, the lusty horn was not a thing to laugh, to scorn. So sing him home, so sing him home. The rest shall bear his burden. The rest shall bear his burden. One more time! The rest shall bear his burden. Another tune along the way. 
What say you now? Is it not past two o'clock? And here, much Orlando. I warrant thee with a pure, hard, and troubled brain, he had taken his bow and arrow and gone forth to sleep. Who comes here? My earnest to see you, fair youth. My gentle Phoebe did bid me give this to you. I know not the contents, but I guess from her stern brow and waspish action she did take while writing of it, it bears an angry tenor. Uh, pardon me, I am but as a guiltless messenger. Patience herself would startle at this letter and play the swaggerer. Bear this, bear all. She says that I lack manners, that I am not fair, that I am proud, that she could not love me were men as rare as Phoenix. Oh, it's my will. Her love is not the hair that I do hunt. Why writes she so to me? Well, shepherd, well. This is a letter of your own device. No, I protest. I know not the contents. She did write it. Oh, please. You are a fool turned to the extremity of love. I saw her hand. She has a leathern hand, a freestone colored hand. I verily did think that her old gloves were on, but twas her hands. She has a housewife's hand, but that's no matter. I say she never did invent this letter. This is a man's invention and his hand. Sure it is hers. Why? It is a boisterous and cruel style, a style for challengers. Women's gentle brain could not drop forth such giant rude invention, such harsh words, blacker in their effect than in the written ink. Wilt thou hear the letter? So please you, for I have not heard it yet, yet heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. Well, she Phoebe's me. Mark how the tyrant writes. Art thou God to shepherd turned that a maiden's heart hath burned? Can a woman rail thus? Are you this railing? Why, thy godhead laid apart, wars thou with a woman's heart. Did you ever hear such a railing? <laughs> Whilst the eye of man did woo me, that could do no vengeance to me, meaning me a beast. If the scorn of your bright eye have power to raise such love in mine, alack, in me what strange effect would they work in mild aspect? Whilst you chide me, I did love. How then might your prayers move? He that brings this love to thee little knows this love in me, and by him seal up thy mind, whether that thy youth and kind will the faithful offer take of me and all that I can make, or else by him my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. Call you this chiding? Oh, last poor shepherd. Oh, do you pity him? No, he deserves no pity. Wilt thou love such a woman? What? to make an instrument of thee, and play false strains upon thee, not to be endured. Well, go your ways to her, shepherd, as I see love hath made thee a tame snake, and say this to her for me, that if she love me, I charge her to love thee. If she will not, I will not have her until thou entreat for her. If you be a true lover hence, and not a word, for here comes more company. Good morrow. Fair ones. Uh, pray you, if you know, uh, where in the purlis of this forest stands a sheep called fence about with olive trees? Oh, west of this place, down in the neighbor bottoms, the rank of willows by the murmuring stream, left on your right hand brings you to this place. But at this hour the house doth keep itself, there's none within. If I may profit by tongue, then shall I know you best by description. The boy's fair of female favor who stows himself like a kind sister, and the woman low, smaller than her brother. Uh, are you not the owner of the house I did inquire for? It is no boast, having been asked to say we are. Orlando doth commend him to you both, and to that youth he causes Rosalind, he leaves this bloody napkin. Are you he? I am. What must we understand by this? Some of my shame. If you were to know of me, what man I am, and how and why and where this handkerchief was stained. I pray you tell it. When last the young Orlando parted from you, he promised to return again within an hour. Pacing through the forest, chewing the fruit of sweet and bitter fancy. Lo, well, what we fell. He threw his eye aside and mark what object did present itself. Under an old oak, mossed with age, and high top bald with dry antiquity, a wretched, ragged old man, overgrown with hair, lay sleeping on his back, about his neck, a 
green and gilded snake wreathed itself and, Nemo and threats, approached the opening of his mouth. But suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unlocked itself and with indented glides did slip away into a bush under which bush's shade. A lioness with others all drawn dry lay couching head on the ground with cat-like watch when that the sleeping man should stir. For tis the royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that doth seem as dead. But suddenly, seeing this, the man would approach the man saw that it was his brother, <gasps> his eldest brother. I have oft heard him speak of that brother, and he did render him the most unnatural amongst men. And well, he might so do. For all I know, he was unnatural. But to Orlando, did he leave him there food to the sucked and hungry lioness? Twice did he turn his back in purpose so. But the kindness, ever nobler than revenge in nature, stronger than his just occasion, made him give battle to the lioness, which quickly fell before him. In which miserable slumber I awake. <gasps> Art thou his brother? Was it you he rescued? <gasps> Was it you who so oft contrived to kill him? T'was I. <gasps> but tis not I. I do not shame to tell you what I was, since my conversion so sweetly tastes, being what I am. But for the bloody napkin. Oh, by and by. From first to last betwixt us two, tears our recountments have most kindly bathed as to how I came into that desert place. In brief, he brought me to the gentle duke, who gave me fresh array and entertainment, committing me unto my brother's love, which led me instantly unto his cave. There, stripped himself, and here across his arm the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled, and now fainted, and cried in his fainting upon his Rosalind. Brief, I recovered him, bound up his wound, and in some small space strong his heart, he sent me hither, stranger as I am, to tell you this story, that you may excuse his broken promise, and to give this napkin dyed in his blood unto the shepherd's youth, when he its sport doth call his Rosalind. Oh, how now, sweet enemy, cousin enemy? <laughs> Many will swoon when they do look upon blood. Oh, there's more in it than that, cousin enemy. He recovers. I would I were at home. Oh, we'll draw you hither. Uh, will you take him by the arm? Yes. Come, you. You want to take over? Sure. You a man? <laughs> you like a man's heart. And so I do. I confess it. Uh, uh, Sir Ralph, a body would think this was well counterfeited. I pray you, tell your brother how well I counterfeited. This was not counterfeit. This was too great a testimony in your complexion that it was passion <laughs> of earnest. Counterfeit, I assure you. Well then, take a good heart and counterfeit to be a man. So I do, I confess it, but I should have been a woman by right. How oh, come you look paler still? Draw you homewards, good sir, go you with us? Ah, twill I, for I must bear answer back if you excuse my brother, Rosalind. I shall devise something, but I pray you commend my counterfeiting to. Will you go? <laughs> we shall find the time, Audrey. Patience, gentle Audrey. Faith, the priest was good enough for all the old gentlemen's sake. Uh, a most vile martyr, the most wicked Oliver, Audrey. But, Audrey, there is a man in the forest here who lays claim to you. I know the man you mean. <laughs> he had no interest in me in all the world. Here comes the man you mean. Oh, it is meat and drink for me to see a clown. We that have good wits have much to answer for. We shall be flouting. We cannot hold. Good evening, Audrey. God give good even, William. Good evening, sir. Oh, good evening, gentle friend. Hey, cover thy head, cover thy head. Hey, Freddy, be covered. How old are you, gentle friend? Twenty and five, sir. Oh, a ripe age. Is thy name Helmepho? William, sir. Oh, a fair name. Was born in the forest here? I, I thank God. Thank God. A fair answer, Art Rich. Faith, sir, 
So-so. So-so is good. Very good. Very excellent good. Yet, it is not. It is but so-so. Art thou wise? I, sir, I have a pretty wit. <laughs> well, thou answers well. But I do now remember a saying. The fool doth think himself to be wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. The heathen philosopher, when he had desired to eat a grape, would open his lips when he put it into his mouth, meaning thereby that grapes were made to eat and lips to open. You do love this maid? I, I do, sir. Give me your hand. Art thou learned? No, sir. Well, then learn this from me. To have is to have. For it is a figure in rhetoric that drink being poured from a cup to a glass would give one the other by emptying the one to the other. All your writers do consent that Ipsa is he. Now you are not Ipsa, for I am he. Uh, which he, sir? He, sir, that must marry this woman. Therefore, you clown, abandon, <laughs> which is in the common, leave the society, which is in the vulgar, presence of this female, which is in the boorish woman. That all said together is, abandon the society of this female, or you clown, perishest, or to thy better understanding, diest, or to wit, I kill thee. Make me away, translate thy life into death. I will overrun thee with policy. I will deal in thee with poison, or in steel, or in rastinado. I will kill thee a hundred and fifty ways. Therefore, tremble and depart. <laughs> Do good, William. God rest you, Mary, sir. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, our master and mistress seek you. Come, oh, away! Trip, trip, Audrey, trip! I attend, I attend. <laughs> Is it possible that on but so little acquaintance you should like that, but seeing you should love and loving, woo and wooing, she would grant? And will you persevere to enjoy her? Neither call the giddiness of it in question. <laughs> the poverty of her, the small acquaintance, my son in wooing, nor her son in consenting. But say with me that I love Eliana. Say with her that she loves me. Commend to us both that we may enjoy each other, for it shall be your good. For my father's house and all the revenue that was old Sir Rollins, I will estate to you and live here and die, shall I? Have my consent. Let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all his contented followers. I will go you, prepare your Eliana. For look you, here comes my Rosalind. God save you, brother. A and to you, her fair sister. Oh, my dear Orlando, how it grieves me to see thee wear thy heart in a scarf. It is my arm. <laughs> I thought thy heart had been wounded with the claws of a lion. Wounded it is both the eyes of a lady. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited to sound when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, and many greater wonders than that. Oh, I know what you mean. Mm. Nay, it is true, there was never anything so sudden but the fighting of two rams. But your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked. No sooner looked, but they loved. No sooner loved, but they sighed. No sooner sighed, but asked one another the reason. No sooner knew the reason, but sought the remedy. And in these degrees, they have built a pair of stairs to marriage, which they will climb incontinent, or else be incontinent before marriage. They are in the very rats of love, and they will together. Clubs cannot part them. They shall be married tomorrow, and I will bid the duke to the nuptial. But oh, how bitter a thing it is to look at happiness through another man's eyes. I shall all the more tomorrow be at the height of heart heaviness, Making my brother happy and having what he wishes for. Then tomorrow I, I shall not serve your turn for Rosalind? I can live no longer by thinking. Well, then, I will weary you no longer with idle talking. 
Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose, that I know you are a gentleman of good conceit. I speak this not that you should bear a good opinion of me, insomuch I say I know you are. Neither do I labor for greater esteem than may in some little measure draw a belief from you to do yourself good and not to grace me. Believe me then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I have, since I was three year old, conversed with a magician, profound in his art and yet not damnable. If you do love Rosalind so much as your gesture cries it out, then tomorrow when your brother marries Eliana, so shall you marry her. I know into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible for me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, to set her before your eyes tomorrow, human as she is, and without any danger. Speaks of sober meanings. By my life, I do, which I tender dearly, though I say I am a magician. So put you in your best array, bid your friends, for if you will be married tomorrow, you shall. And to Rosalind, if you will. Oh, but look you who comes here, a lover of mine and a lover of hers. Youth, you have done me much ungentleness to show the letter that I writ to you. I care not if I have. It is my study to seem despiteful and ungentle towards you. You are there followed by a faithful shepherd. Look on him. Love him. He worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what tis to love. Uh, it is to be all made of sighs and tears. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. Uh, it is to be all made of faith and service. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. Uh, it is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, all patience, humbleness, and impatience, <laughs> all purity, trial, and observance. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. If this be so, why blame me to love you? If this be so, why blame me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? Why do you speak to, why blame you me to love you? To her that is not here, and doth not hear. I pray you, no more of this. Tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. I will help you if I can. I would love you if I could. Meet me all here tomorrow. I'll marry you if ever I marry woman, and I shall be married tomorrow. I will satisfy you if ever I satisfied man, and you shall be married tomorrow. I will content you if what pleases you contents you, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind, meet. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. So fare you well. I've left you your commands. I'll not fail if I live. Nor I. Nor I. Tomorrow is the joyful day, Audrey. Tomorrow we shall be married. I do desire it with all my heart. I hope it is no dishonest desire to desire to be a woman of the world. <laughs> That's one of the banished duke's pages. Well met, honest gentleman. Oh, by my trust, sit, sit, and uh, a song. In faith, I am yours. Shall I go into clapping roundly with spitting and hawking and saying my voice is hoarse? Which is the prologue to a bad voice. Nay, in faith and in tune. There was a lover and his lass. Hey and a ho, hey nonny nonny no. That o'er the green corn field did pass. Hey and a ho, hey nonny nonny no. In the springtime. Oh. The only pretty ring time when birds just sing, hey ding a ding a ding. <laughs> Sweet lovers love the spring. <laughs> uh, truly, young lady, though uh, there was no matter with the ditty, uh, although the note was very untunable. <clears throat> You are deceived, sir. I lost not my tune. I kept my tune. By my troth, I count it as time lost to hear such a foolish song. God help thee and God mend your voice. Come, Audrey. Dost thou believe, Orlando, that the boy can do all this that he had promised it? Sometimes I do believe and sometimes do not. As uh, those that fear they hope and know they fear. Once more, what's our contract is urged? 
you say, if I bring in your Rosalind, you will bestow her on this here Orlando? That would I, had I kingdoms to give with her. You say you will have her when I bring her. That would I, for I have all kingdoms king. You say you'll marry me if I be willing. That would I, should I die the hour after. But if you do refuse to marry me, you'll give yourself to this most faithful shepherd. So is the bargain. You say that you'll have Phoebe if she will. I thought I have her in Desborough one day. I have promised to make all these matters even. Keep you your word, O Duke, to give your daughter. You yours, Orlando, to receive her. Keep you your word, Phoebe, that you'll marry me, or else refusing me to marry this shepherd. And keep you your word, O Silvius, that you'll wed Phoebe. From hence I go to make all these doubts even. I do remember in the shepherd boy some lively touches of my daughter's favor. <laughs> My good lord, when first I laid eyes on him, methought he was a brother to your daughter. But, my good lord, the boy is forest born, and hath been studied in the, the rudiments of many desperate studies, and by his uncle, whom he reports to be a great magician, obscured in the forest circle. There is sure another flood toward, and these couples are coming to the yard. Uh, here come a pair of very strange beasts, which in all tongues are called fools. Salutation and greetings to you all. Good my lord, bid him welcome. This is the motley-minded gentleman that I have so often met in the forest. He hath been a courtier, he swears. And if any man doubt that, let him put me to my purgation. I have trod a measure. I have flattered a lady. I have been politic with my friend. I have undone three tailors. I have had four quarrels. And have like to have fought one. And how is that taken up? Oh, in faith, we met and discovered our quarrel was upon the seventh cause. Ha, seventh <laughs> cause? Good my lord, like this fellow? I like him very well. God yield you, sir. I do desire you of the like. I press in here, sir, to be among the other country copulatives to swear and to forswear as <clears throat> marriage binds and blood breaks. Oh, my oh. faith, he's very swift and sententious. <laughs> According to the fool's bolt, sir, and other dulcet diseases. But for the seventh cause, how did you find the seventh cause? Uh, upon a lie seven times removed. Bear your body more seeming, Audrey. <laughs> it is thus, sir. <clears throat> I did dislike the cut of a certain courtier's beard. And how oft did you say his beard was not well cut? <laughs> Well, I durst not go further than the lie circumstantial, and he durst not give me the lie direct. So we measured swords and parted. Can you nominate in order now the degrees of the lie? Oh, 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 sir, we quarrel in print by the book, as you have good books for good manners. I will list the, the degrees. <clears throat> the first, the retort courteous. The second, the quick modest. The third, the reply churlish. The fourth, the reproof valiant. The fifth, the countercheck quarrelsome. The sixth, the lie with circumstance. The seventh, the lie direct. And you may avoid but the lie direct, and you may avoid that too, if but with an if. I knew when seven justices had all quarrels among themselves, but when they could not meet, they could not quarrel. For when they did meet, one of them offered but of an if. As in, if you say so, then I said so. So they shook hands, swore brothers, and parted. Your if is your only peacemaker. Much virtue in it. Is this not a rare fellow? He is as good as anything, and yet a fool. He uses his folly like a stalking horse, and under the presentation of that, he shoots his wit. That is their mirth in heaven, when earthly things made even atone together. Good Duke, receive thy daughter. Hymen from heaven brought her, yea, brought her hither that thou mightest join her hand with his, whose heart within his bosom is. To you I give myself, for I am yours. To you I give myself, for I am yours. If there be truth in sight, you are my daughter. If there be truth in sight, thou art my Rosalind. If sight and shape be true, well then, my love, adieu. I'll have no father if you be not he. I'll have no husband if you be not he. Nor ne'er wed woman if you be not she. Peace ho, I bar confusion. Desire must make conclusion of these most strange events. Here's eight that must take hands to join in Hyman's bands if truth holds true contents. You and you, no cross shall part. 
You and you are heart in heart. You to his love must accord, or have a woman to your lord. <laughs> you and you are sure together as the winter to foul weather. <laughs> what else a wedlock can we sing? Feed yourselves with questioning, that reason wonder may diminish how thus we met and these things finish. I would love to be on a red honor, high honor and renown to high men, God of every town. Ah, my dear niece, welcome thou art to me. Even daughter welcome in no less degree. I shall not eat my word, now thou art mine. Thy faith, my fancy to thee, audience. doth combine. Let me have an audience for a word or two. <laughs> I am the second son of old Sir Roland, that oh, bring these tidings no. to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick, hearing how that every day men of great worth resorted to this forest, addressed a mighty power which were on foot in his own conduct, purposely to take his brother here and put him to the sword. And to the skirts of this wild wood he came, where, meeting with an old religious man, after some question with him, was converted, both from his enterprise and from the world. His crown bequeathing to his vanished brother, and all their lands restored to them again who were with him exiled. <laughs> this to be true, I do engage my life. Oh, no. <laughs> Welcome, young man. <laughs> Thou offerest fairly to thy brother's wedding. <laughs> To one his lands withheld, and to the other a land itself at large, a potent dukedom. <laughs> Let us first in this forest do those ends which here were well begun and well begot. And after, every of this happy number that have endured shrewd days and nights with us shall share in the good of our returned fortune, according to their states. Forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry. Play music, and you brides and bridegrooms all, with measure heaped in joy to the measure's fall. Sir, by your patience, if I have heard you rightly, the Duke hath put on a religious life and thrown into neglect the pompous court. He hath. To him will I. Out of these convertites there is much to be heard and learned. You, to your former honor, I bequeath your virtue and your patience well deserves it. You, to a love that your true faith doth merit. You, to your love, your lands, and great allies. You, to a long and well-deserved bed. And you, to your wrangling, for thy loving voyage is but two months victualed. So, to your pleasures! I am for other than for dancing measures. Stay, Jaquie, stay! To see no pastime I, what you would have I'll stay to know in your abandoned cave. Proceed, proceed, and we'll begin these rites, as we do trust they'll end in true delight.
not the fashion to see the lady epilogue, but it is no more unhandsome than to see the man the prologue. If it be true that good wine needs no bush, then it may well be said that good plays need no epilogue. And yet, to good wine they do use good bush, and good plays prove better with good epilogues. What a case am I in, then, that I am neither a good epilogue, nor can insinuate with you on behalf of a good play. <laughs> I'm not furnished like a beggar, therefore to beg would not become me. My way is to conjure you, and I'll begin with the women. Women, I charge you for the love you bear to men, to like as much of the play as please you. <laughs> and men, I charge you for the love you bear to women, as I perceive by your simpering none of you hates them. That between you and the woman, the play may please. Were I not wed, I would kiss as many of you as had beards that liked me, complexions that pleased me, and breaths that I defied not. And I'm sure that as many of you as have good beards or good faces or sweet breaths will, for my kind offer, when I make curtsy, bid me farewell. <laughs> <laughs>